If I were to ask you, what is the best moment in the Lord of the Rings, what would you say? I know it's a ridiculous question, there's just too many of them, right? There's the epic battle stuff, Gandalf and the Rohirrim showing up at Helm's Deep, Theoden and his army coming to the aid of Gondor. There are the heart-wrenching moments, Sam's monologue at the end of the Two Towers, King Aragorn walking up to the hobbits and telling them, You bow to no one. And then there's the Mines of Moria, like, all of it, beginning to end. But within this wealth of cinematic ecstasy, there is one particular sequence that always stood out to me. About a third of the way into the return of the king, Pippin, in defiance of Denethor, lights the emergency beacons to let Rohan know that Gondor needs help. I probably don't have to convince you that the sequence that follows is really cool. I mean the direct visceral impact of the visuals and the score, that part speaks for itself. But as for the reason why this particular moment stands out so much, why it is the way that it is, that's where things get more interesting. Because when you think about it, what's the emotion here? Aragorn facing down the Uruk High by himself is heroic, it's a pure display of courage and selflessness. Frodo leaving Middle-earth is, well, it's sad, even if you know it's for the best. But what do you really feel during the lighting of the beacons? It's clearly not just, hey, that's a cool way of sending a message, or let's pay tribute to this iconic moment from the book. Because did you know this wasn't even in the book? Well, not exactly. In the book, the lighting of the beacons does happen, but it's Denethor himself who orders it before Gandalf and Pippin even arrive in Minas Tirith. They just kind of notice it while they're en route to the city. Later, Denethor also sends a rider to Theoden carrying the same message, which pushes the importance of the beacons even further into the background. But in the movie, Peter Jackson not only changes the scene around, we'll get back to that later, but he also blows it way up and places it front and center to turn it into a capital M moment. Between cutting away from Gandalf's gaze in Gondor and reaching that of Aragorn in Rohan, about 80 seconds pass. That's more than a minute of flying over mountains and lighting fires. It may not sound like a lot, but that's quite a bit of screen time to convey the relatively simple plot element of Gondor calling to Rohan for aid. So what was Jackson thinking here? Why did he add so much weight to this particular scene? Well, I think it is because he looked at the lighting of the beacons, and hidden within it, he saw the perfect microcosm of everything that the Lord of the Rings is about. This video is brought to you by our creator-owned streaming service Nebula, for which I have an exciting limited offer that I'll talk more about at the end. First off, to explain what I mean, let's briefly talk about metaphors in cinema, which is a bit tricky because it's such a broad subject that can be approached from a pretty much infinite amount of ways. And so to sidestep the whole anything can mean anything, I want to focus on one particular element, which is density of meaning. You can convey a lot with very little. When Casino Royale first came out, it had the job of introducing us to a new, much grittier James Bond. This interpretation would be less of a gentleman and more of a weapon for blunt force trauma. One who would stop at nothing and whose actions would often border on recklessness. And they communicated all of that in the opening set piece, and in particular, through one simple contrasting moment. That's density of meaning. That's how you add layers of revelation to a scene. But we're just getting started here. Because while this was a nice example of communicating information about a character through action, sometimes, whether by design or by accident, the metaphorical weight of a scene can become so dense that it captures not just one story element, but the entire story in its fullness, thereby becoming a perfect microcosm of everything that it's about. At the end of Rogue One, when the main plot is pretty much resolved, the movie introduces one final obstacle. 
Is it a blatant appeal to our nostalgia? Of course it is. But there's something about this scene that has always stuck with me. And that's coming from someone who didn't really grow up with Star Wars and therefore isn't that susceptible to its nostalgia baiting. To recap the story in one sentence, Rogue One is all about the birth of the Rebellion. And more specifically, about what it means to be a rebel. Which, as we come to learn throughout the story, is about sacrifice, about dedicating yourself to a greater cause, a greater collective unity, by surrendering your life and your individualism. It is, somewhat paradoxically, anti-heroic. Or, to put it like this, it's not about elevating specific individuals onto a heroic pedestal, but about focusing on and celebrating the achievements of a larger movement which has proven to be quite a challenge for movies as we generally connect much more strongly to the former, to individual characters and their individual heroic journeys. It's a chance for you to make a fresh start. We think you might be able to help us. Rogue One 2 cannot escape having a narrative that's centered around a select group of individual characters. Because even though it tries to emphasize that these are mere foot soldiers, a ragtag band of misfits whose names won't be remembered by history, they still have explicit heroic journeys that, from a storytelling perspective, give them a certain level of significance, of uniqueness, that takes away some of that focus on the greater rebellion. And this is where that final scene comes in. For context, our heroes have just uploaded the plans for the Death Star, which contain the critical weakness that Luke will later exploit, and have sacrificed themselves in the process. The plans arrive on the Rebel space station where the story easily could have ended, were it not for that final appearance of Darth Vader adding one last complication to the victory. But pay attention to what really happens next, because while it may have been a bit too easy to get distracted by the awe-inspiring fury of the iconic villain, the part that always gets me is seeing that series of completely nameless soldiers who, in the face of certain death, keep selflessly passing along that all-important data to ensure the victory of the greater cause. It's one final reminder that even though you can certainly zoom in on the actions of specific individuals, in the end, the actual victory is not decided by the heroics of a few, but by the sacrifices of many. That's the essence of a true rebellion. That's the essence of Rogue One. And it is perfectly captured here, within one single moment. Perhaps the defining trait of a perfect metaphor in this sense that it forms a complete microcosm of the movie in its entirety is that you can isolate it from the story at large, watch it completely out of context, and still be able to get the same themes and ideas that the whole movie is trying to convey. If you haven't seen the classic 1967 movie Cool Hand Luke, I can tell you what it's about by showing you this one single sequence. Hey buddy, slow down. Yeah, well, the man won't see, let's just give it to him. A chain gang is given the task of tarring a long road on a hot day, while most prisoners, beaten down by the system, are trying to spend as little energy as possible, just trying to survive. Luke seems determined to give it his all, and inspires his fellow inmates to do the same in a subversive act of rebellion that turns their punishment into a euphoric victory. One that, for a brief moment, reminds them of what it means to be free. Yeah, well, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. Christopher Nolan is also particularly good at creating these dense, all-encompassing metaphors. Take that final set piece in The Dark Knight, for example. We've got bad guys disguised as hostages and hostages disguised as bad guys, with the police about to make a fatal mistake. In this confused mess of moral ambiguity, it's the Batman who sees clearly though at a price, for his heightened vision is powered by a highly controversial technology that questions to what extent Batman is infringing on the very freedoms he is trying to protect. This is wrong. I've got to find this man, Lucius. 
Altogether, it creates a sequence that conveys the chaotic fight against an enemy that doesn't easily let itself be identified. A fight that is putting innocent civilians at risk, and one that demands increasingly desperate measures to stay on top. And if that doesn't perfectly capture the Dark Knight as a whole, then I don't know what does. There is a moment! Interstellar 2 presents a beautiful microcosm of itself in the famous docking sequence which, as I've talked about in my extensive review of that movie, is highly beloved precisely because it captures so much depth and meaning in what seems like such a relatively simple action scene. Because what we see here is not just a spaceship spiraling towards destruction, it's literally humanity's last chance for survival. It's all of our hope as a species condensed into a single object, set against the grand backdrop of cosmic insignificance. And as the AI robot, the perfect stand-in for the part of us that's calculative, rational, reasonable, tells our main hero that salvation is impossible, he goes for it anyways. Because as much as we like to tell ourselves otherwise, when it comes down to it, when it's about the things that truly matter, it's not our rational considerations that drive our actions, it's our emotions and beliefs, our attachments and connections that push us beyond all else. It's a message that the movie somewhat awkwardly tries to convey in other moments, but here it all comes together in one desperate, yet beautifully exhilarating leap of faith. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. Now, going back to The Lord of the Rings, I probably don't have to give you another lengthy essay on what it's about. At this point I'm kind of assuming that, like me, you're intimately familiar with the story and have been feeling both blessed and frustrated because of it. Blessed because your time on Earth just so happened to overlap with the creation of these movies. And frustrated because no movie has given you quite the same experience ever since. Anyways, if I had to capture it in one word, I'd say that when you break it down to its absolute essence, The Lord of the Rings is about hope. Hope not just as an individual trait that a person can acquire or lose, but also as a function of the world, as a tangible force that works our collective being. Through the mythological trappings of his Middle-earth epic, one of the fundamental questions that Tolkien asks is, why does evil feel so all-devouring, and goodness so fragile? Why does it seem so easy to give in to despair and so difficult to hold on to hope? Is despair simply more infectious, more potent than hope? And if so, is all of this, all of our effort, all of our lives and our suffering, not just a denial of our inevitable doom? For if despair is the more powerful force, Will it not eventually overtake everything anyways? If our world and our being is but a slow descent into darkness, if the fall of men is already predetermined, why not just give up and surrender? Why pretend to have a fighting chance? It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frugal. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? These questions, and more, are answered over the course of about 9 to 12 hours of movies depending on whether you are watching the theatrical or extended editions. But you can find the compressed essence of it right here. Gandalf and Pippin arrive in Minas Tirith where they find the grieving and growingly delusional Denethor. Again, Jackson made some changes to the context here where instead of Denethor having reluctantly sent a message to Rowan even though he's not hopeful about it being answered, he now explicitly forbids the beacons to even be lit, and completely refuses to engage in any action that would lead to some glimmer of hope. The enemy is on your doorstep. Where are Gondor's armies? It turns the already gloomy steward into the ultimate force of fatalistic pessimism. Someone who has lost all hope and who is about to doom himself while dragging his city, his people, and pretty much all of Middle-earth down with him. It's a subtle but important change, 
because it more explicitly reflects the same dynamic between hope and despair that the movie's ultimate antagonist also confronts us with. If we look at the One Ring, what we have is an object that seems skewed towards evil prevailing. After all, to resist the ring's temptation as an individual is merely to save one soul in a world that's still slipping into darkness. While at the same time, if that same person does succumb to its power, the world would be doomed in its entirety. It's because of this that the central conflict in the Lord of the Rings, the one that's fought on the inside, most explicitly by Frodo who carries the actual ring, but in many ways by every character in the story, feels like a rather passive one. Or at least, one that's not as impactful or cinematic as conflicts that are resolved by heroes facing down and actively vanquishing their enemies. Though to claim a victory against evil in this sense seems to be decided less by what one does, and more so by what one doesn't do by not sacrificing one's integrity, by not giving in to evil, by resisting the ring's temptation. It makes it understandable that evil appears to be the stronger force, the force that's pressing onto that which can either hold or break, but which cannot seem to fight back. Or, you know, that's what it wants you to think. Peregrine took my lad. There is a task now to be done. Another opportunity for one of the Shire folk to prove their great worth. By giving the task of lighting the beacons against Denethor's orders to Pippin, who here symbolically represents not just his own character progression, but also an encapsulation of the burden that Frodo carries, i.e. the conflict that everyone in Middle-earth faces, Jackson succinctly captures the fundamental argument that Tolkien ends up making that this supposed dynamic between hope and despair is actually the other way around. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. For in Pippin's scenario, to do nothing is to let the enemy overwhelm the city without resistance. To do nothing is to fail. And so for Pippin, to hold on to hope means to act. It more clearly demonstrates that to resist evil, to resist despair, is not a passive act. It's an active defiance. A force that can and is fighting back against the shadow that's slowly enveloping the land. A force that does more than merely denying evil. A force that takes more than merely denying evil. That is driven by strength and by courage, and by the active commitment to the belief that as Sam puts it at the end of the two towers, that there is good in the world, and that it's worth fighting for. And though it may not always appear this impactful, this is exactly what Frodo demonstrates every step of his harrowing journey. It's what Aragorn, Sam and Gandalf and all the other heroes demonstrate every second that they're not giving in. Every enemy they face despite the odds being against them. Every desperate battle they ride into knowing full well it might be their last. And more than that, as Pippin defies Denethor's despair by igniting that first beacon, we are shown something else, something that is perhaps even more important. Hope is not only active, it is consequential. At one point in the story, Gandalf talks about there never being much hope. Just a fool's hope. And indeed, when you look at it from an individual perspective, it does seem somewhat foolish to risk your life for what only seems to be a small chance of victory, to trust those that might betray you, to put all your hope in a cause that feels lost from the start. It is true that to hope is to take a leap of faith, and that to imagine victory in the face of a darkness this overwhelming is to imagine what feels like a miracle. But as we zoom out just a little bit, as we see one fire lighting up after the other in a chain reaction that will eventually mobilize an entire army, we get what is perhaps the best visual metaphor for the idea that hope does in fact reach beyond our individuality, that it is contagious, powerful, that it can escalate into a grand movement that, when looking at it whole, as Peter Jackson does in this one sequence, feels nothing short of miraculous. And yet, the real clue here is that hope, 
and the way it operates in the world, the way it establishes connections to reinforce itself, is actually not that miraculous at all. In fact, it is perfectly reasonable and logical. Going back to Denethor, besides being that ultimate embodiment of pessimism, his erratic behavior is also explicitly shown as completely irrational. As he denies the enemy standing at his very gates, as he carelessly breaks all bonds with those closest to him, he stands as a dramatized compression of the number of characters who at one point believe that they can stay out of the conflict, that they can avoid having to fight for what they hold dear, or that they can align themselves to their aggressors in such a way that they will somehow come out on the other end unscathed. But what we see here through Denethor is that it's this kind of willful ignorance, this banal denial of hope and of what it demands of us, that is the truly irrational stance. Though it might seem to offer security or an escape, in the end it reveals itself to be but a vacuum that will leave us isolated and alone. Hope, on the other hand, works exactly the other way around, though demanding courage, responsibility and a bit of a leap of faith, it ultimately proves itself to be a unifying force, an ever spreading fire that only grows stronger through its presence in others and one that can never be truly extinguished as long as there is someone willing to ignite that first spark. Did you know that if you had watched this video on Nebula you'd just be watching the credits now while enjoying some beautiful music? All my videos have unique versions that are completely ad and sponsor free and that can be found only on Nebula. And if you want to enjoy my work in its purest form, while at the same time getting access to exclusive material from myself and many other creators you know and love, you can now do so for the rest of your life with just one click of a button. That's right, after a huge success, Nebula's lifetime membership is back for the month of December, meaning that for a one-time payment of $300, you'll be giving me a nice Christmas bonus, offering your contribution to an amazing platform that not only supports but elevates its creators, and get instant access to a wide variety of original productions. Lindsay Ellis, for example, has a fantastic exclusive video on The Lord of the Rings that I highly recommend. Do note that Nebula's lifetime membership is not the cheapest option. That would still be the annual subscription with the 40% discount from my creator link. But if you want to give us that extra boost into the new year, and secure yourself with lifelong access to our platform, then a lifetime membership might be worth considering. You'll be supporting my work either way, so check out go.nebula.tv LSOO for the best option for you. Thanks for watching.